was born by the roadside somewhere in County Kildare. <laughs> Welcome to episode number 10. Can't believe we've got this far. We're going to go to 100, lads. I can feel it. We'll be at 100 by Christmas. Well, near enough anyway. I'm Fia Rua. Um, you're listening to the Kildare Speaks podcast, which profiles individuals and sometimes groups and causes in the county of Kildare or connected with County Kildare. Uh, last episode was episode number 9, and it featured a war of independence in County Kildare specifically with James Durney, and he was a fantastic guest, and he gave me loads of information about what was going on in Kildare during the War of Independence. I'd recommend you have a listen to it if you're interested in your history. And as well as that, I've got a lot, I've got some messages from people and stuff asking questions and stuff like that about uh, various, you know, um, people connected with the War of Independence, like Mick Salmon, who was the referee during the Bloody Sunday um, massacre that took place during the War of Independence in Crow Park. Um, I would recommend people check out the Kildare Decade of Commemorations Facebook page because there's tons of information, there's archive stuff, there's um, amazing pictures and stuff. So they've been working really hard uh, to try and get that out to people. So I just want to kind of just let people, that's the place to go if you're looking for stuff connected with the War of Independence in Kildare. And thanks again for the feedback. So moving on to episode number 10. For episode number 10, I'm going to interview a fella called Robert Mulhern from NACE. Robert Mulhern has uh, become more and more known for his work on radio documentaries, the documentary on one. He's done loads of stuff in documentary on one. Uh, some of my favourite uh, radio pieces, like I was listening today to uh, a, um, a documentary he did concerning the whistleblowers within the Gardaí. Uh, John Wilson, I think, was the name of the man he was interviewing from a while back. He's done recently Polonium and the Piano Player, which was just recently, um, I think it was a two-parter. Uh, I think that was connected with the BBC and uh, RTE. Uh, Polonium, and and the P- P- Polonium and the Piano Player. There's a big P there. Polonium's have no, um, have no P guard. Do you know the, the... Anyways, that's technical stuff, but I don't have one today. Do you know the one that protects the P's and the, pips, the pop, pop shield? That's the one, you see? I have all the tech terms down. Polonium and the Piano Player is connected with the... Um, Russian uh, infantry and, um, trying to poison somebody and it's connected with an Irish musician and it's a fant- fantastic story check it out it's on the RT um, RT player or the RT website uh, or the RT podcast uh, the documentary on one podcast but the nobody zone has kind of gripped the nation throughout the summer it certainly gripped me and uh, I couldn't believe it when I said oh wow I can get Robert Mulhern and he's going to give me a chat and I get loads of inside information about the nobody zone shh well I squeeze as much out of it as possible. If you haven't listened to the Nobody's Zone, maybe have a listen to it before this podcast. But if you're listening now, stay tuned because I mightn't get you back again. <laughs> but the Nobody's Zone uh, certainly grip people and um, it's concerning a fellow called Patrick, um, Kieran Patrick Kelly, who was around London in the 1970s, a time when the Irish weren't treated great and he was accused of, uh, well, accused of mur- uh, murdering a few people. <laughs> so uh, nobody knows the truth. So Robert Mulhern went about trying to make a podcast to uh, discover more and more about the case. And it was a fascinating podcast called The Nobody Zone. And I'd advise you to check it out. So here's episode 10 of Kildare Speaks, Robert Mulhern. And thanks to Kildare County Council. Enjoy, folks. Hello, Robert. How are you today? Hi, Owen. Uh, I'm good. Thank you. And uh, listen, thanks very much for inviting me onto your show. No problem, Robert. Uh, You're in London. Is that right? Crystal Palace in southeast london i'm just sitting with a cup of coffee now and uh looking out onto some green actually at the back of the house which is great we're in uh, just by the park there in crystal palace so and is, is, Bar- is, is boris johnson letting you out of the house he is he is bits and pieces and uh but to be honest we wouldn't be going too far between the house and the park and yeah the shop yeah. and uh and, and ha, have you been at home in Kildare since the lockdown or since the COVID business? I had to come back for a job for Sky um, that brought me into Dublin in August. So 
I was there for a bit and then um, I was there kind of long enough so it was safe to go down to Nace, see me mum and dad. Yeah. That was yeah. the first time I've been there since, um, since March. February. February. Yeah. yeah. There's been that, there was that period, maybe midsummer. Now, don't worry, listeners, I'm not going to go on about COVID for the next <laughs> whatever long. But um, there was that period in the middle of the summer where it kind of felt a little bit of normality was coming back. Yeah, and I think it was actually just after that. So it was after the Kildare lockdown. Um, I think the Kildare lockdown had just lifted Yeah. on the Friday, I think. Um, and or actually, it was, I think, was it a Monday? That it lifted. I can't remember which day, okay. but whatever day it lifted. Anyway, I was in Dublin, and I said, "Right, I'm, I'm going to go down now and yeah. see my mum and dad." And I stayed with my sister, and um, it was great. It's great to see them. So, how long are you in London now? I'm 13 years in London now. I came on the first of April 2008 for three months uh, to cover a girl who was on maternity leave in the the Irish Post newspaper. And, right. Uh, that was it. And that would have been kind of coinciding with the kind of the economic crash that happened around 2008, 2009 as well, wouldn't it? It was. I was working with my dad. Um, my dad has his own business and um, I was working with him and kind of studying journalism at night. And then the Irish Examiner were running an internship in journalism and I think I was I was twenty nine uh, right. when I applied to do the internship. I was doing bits for the local papers and bits yeah. of PR work, and um, and I was lucky enough anyway to get one of the internships. And I ended up in the Kildare Nationalist, and yeah. I was there for six months. And then the same group of newspapers that owned the Examiner owned the Irish Post in London, right? And it was totally kind of out of the blue. They said, "Listen, there's a spot." for um you know on the news desk over in london does anyone want to kind of put up their hand and go and yeah. i was i remember you know kind of i suppose it didn't dwell on it too long because i thought it was only going to be three months but it still, yeah. it still felt like a big decision at the time and i had a volkswagen golf and i left that in the driveway of my mom and dad's because i said i'm going to be back for that and yeah there's other things that i said i'm going to be back for that as well i'm only going for a few months but as you say, I came in 2008 and then I think Lehman Brothers happened later that year. Right. And things started getting pretty bad. And they kept extending the contract then in, in the Irish Post to give me another six months and another six months. And then and they gave me a full-time job. And um, yeah, I mean, just just time just kept moving on. As it, as it did for many generations of Irish people in London. Um, you seem to be kind of in it, 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 there's something about what your work um in the podcasts and in the journalism that is it, i think that the irish in london is something that interests you would i be right in saying that it is and and i miss it now because for so many of the early years in london like that that was kind of my beat irish stories in london and um i mean it was just so kind of rich with characters and um mm. particularly older people and I suppose it really struck when I came here. At um, I'd always heard the success stories of emigration to America, but yeah, you know, probably no more than yourself. Growing up in yeah. the eighties, news from London was always dominated by, um, you know, IRA bombs going off or whatever it was, and yeah, I suppose, and there was that generation in nineteen fifties that were kind of forgotten, kind of forgotten. But I think that kind of the political relationship between the islands and everything that was going on through the 80s. Was that was a dominant one, people. yeah. Yeah, and I think it just kind of overshadowed like all these other stories that were kind of there to be told. So, mm. I mean, it was, it, was, it was great fun and you kind of felt plugged in to the, to the community, you know, as big as London is. And I remember being kind of feeling overwhelmed by the scale of it when it first yeah. came. But, but what's, there is a kind of network. I think I remember watching, uh, you know, when you're, you're, you're just on the, on the internet and you're messing, looking at YouTube and you're going down a rabbit hole or whatever. And then I found this old uh, documentary on the Irish in London, you know, um, 
and it depicted these these lads that were on the construction sites in the bars in these wet, damp clothes. A lot of them got uh, the tuberculosis from the lungs and the dampness of the clothes soaking into their skin. They were paid their wages by the, the barman. You know, uh, I just got really, really um, sad about it. And, and, and uh, you know, I felt there was this whole huge world that here in Ireland we kind of forget about, you know. I remember interviewing a fella up there, um, an older man now, and uh, he was telling me how there were two stories kind of about that period that you're talking about. And um, when he used to get paid on a Friday, the first thing he'd do is go to the post office, put £20 in an envelope and post the envelope to himself. Mm. So he knew that he knew that the 20 quid then would come to him in the post yeah. on a Monday or a Tuesday when the wages would be gone. Yeah. And um, he used to buy a suit. He used to buy a kind of a cheap suit on a Friday with his wages um, because they'd be all up in um, Cricklewood Broadway and um, yeah. the kind of discos along there. Wear the suit for the weekend and then turn up on Monday morning onto the trucks in the same suit, you know. Yeah. Do, a full week, do a full week's work in the same suit on the jackhammer kind of up in the tunnels in Maidstone they could be anywhere by Friday the, the suit would be worn out good and man <laughs> wages, wages wages paid again and crazy all, buy himself another suit again and yeah, yeah. I mean but the thing about crazy. it the thing about it was that the, there was this the stereotype of the lads in London are doing well so they couldn't be coming home to show their family the true story you know they have to stay stay over there send a bit of money over there come home at christmas and pretend you're loaded you know there was a lot of stigma attached to that world as well yeah yeah no absolutely and um, and i mean i suppose it's there's so many like my uncle jimmy was over here kind of working and you know, I remember. I don't, think there, I don't think there's any family in the country yeah. that, like, you know, without some member that that had to emigrate between the 1950s and the 1980s. Yeah, I think it, it, you kind of took the words out of my mouth there because I remember chatting to a man and he was saying, you know, every house on the street mm. there was someone in London. Um, yes, yeah, that house, you know? yeah. So, like, did that brings us nicely on to um, a subject, <laughs> Mr. Kieran Patrick Kelly. Um, sure. The, the the soundtrack of my uh, of my lockdown during the summer. I was painting the house here in Westmead, and uh, I don't own this house in case the tax man's after me. I'm renting here in Westmead, and uh, I was painting the house, and uh, <laughs> I had the the, the the serial killer podcast on the nobody zone, which which you've done brilliantly. And uh, anytime my neighbours would come in to say hello to me, they'd hear all this dark stuff coming out of the speaker, and they're like, "Jesus, your man's gone mad altogether." No, yeah, I mean, the Kelly story is like, it's probably, I probably never kind of come across another story like it, I suppose. I mean, it's it's kind of been a story that I've been working on since 2015, and there's still more to come on it, actually. Yeah, I hear there's two more new episodes coming. Yeah, there's two more episodes. I'm actually, I'm going doing a recording on Thursday um, related to one of those new episodes coming out, and I mean, it just was a kind of thing, a chance, you know, it's... Um, was the, re- the release of the tapes was a big moment, was it? Of the, pl- the police tapes after 30-something years or something? Yeah, well, I mean, to, to try and get those tapes off the police, and I suppose just for your listeners, it was, you know... I think, you know, I think Robert, we'll, we'll just go with maybe uh, no spoiler alerts, because I think what I, I, I think... If anybody hasn't heard the podcast, go and listen to it now and then come back and listen to the rest of this podcast. Is that okay with you? Ah, oh, listen, thanks very much for saying <laughs> that and doing Yeah, but that. just to just, just we, we, we won't worry about giving stuff away as regards, you know, um, how the podcast develops because I yeah. think, I yeah. think a, lot, a lot of people have heard it and a lot of people who are listening to this would probably want to hear, um, you know, how the story developed and, 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 you know, and your own feelings as you came along to the various uh, moments in the story. Listen, that's great. I mean, um, but yeah, I don't think it would be anything. I'm not... I wouldn't be spoiling anything to say, like, we kind of, I heard about this story in 2015, it was reported in some of the, the tabloids over here, and um, the story that was being reported was just, you know, Irish serial killer in London responsible for X amount of deaths, and I think I'd probably been here about seven years at that stage, and I suppose I, I thought 
of all the kind of many pints and many pubs across London through that seven years, I thought, you know, there was a decent chance you'd kind of hear something about Kelly. Yeah. And the fact that 